Good morning. And let's go ahead and begin class with prayer this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and study. We ask that your spirit will join us and it will fill our hearts with love. We want to give thanks to you in the Thanksgiving season for the many blessings you've given us, ultimately for the truth about how you run your, your kingdom and your government of, of truth, love, and freedom. We ask that you will fill our hearts with these principles and we can reflect you, we pray in your holy name. Amen. And we are doing lesson number 10 in the quarterly, the sanctuary, and the lesson this week is called the eschato eschatological uh, day of atonement. And before we even start, I just want to review the high points from last week. From last week. And I'm just going to go through the questions that at the beginning of last week, I'm not going to go through the lesson, just, just the questions to see, and I throw it out there for you guys to give me the answers this week. So you'll have to remember everything I told you from last week. Okay? All right. First, first, does the Bible teach that any sanctuary was in existence other than the one in heaven in 1844 and since? Yes. Okay? Um, I heard one little... Very weak, yes. <laughs> the rest of you, what do you think? Yes, yeah. yes. okay. Um, why, does the, why does the heavenly sanctuary need cleansing and from what? Mm. Why does it need cleansing? Why? What's the reason? Yes. It's the lies that Satan <laughs> proposed. Yes. Before the world. Yes. Number one, where did sin begin? <laughs> yes, with whom? And what did he do? He lied. He, he lied. He's the father of lies. So the lies told that infected the minds of angelic beings first, and then infected the minds of Adam and Eve, and infect the minds of humanity today. We need our minds cleansed from these lies, and we need our characters transformed. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. All right, by what means is, is the sanctuary cleansed, and who cleanses it? What's the means, the method, the mode? Evidence. Pardon? By evidence. Evidence. Evidence? Well, Yes, love. Yes, and where's the source of this evidence? Jesus. That's right. Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So yes, we have the evidence to dispel the lies in the life of Christ, and we get a new character, a new heart motive through Christ and what he's achieved for us. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. Okay? Uh, is this cleansing related to judgment? Yes. What do you mean? Yes, yes excellent. Okay. Um, Clarify judgment. Yes. It, it is only by coming to the right judgment about our situation, our very condition, our need, God, his character, the truth about Satan, sin, what it does to us, and ultimately the truth about God's character that we can make a judgment on whether to trust him and open our heart to him or not. And that's the key to whether we have restoration, reconciliation, salvation, whatever you want to call it, healing, or we remain alienated and separated from God. And then our records in heaven are simply the accurate reflections of our characters here. So the avenue to cleanse the record is through transformation of your heart and mind. That's the avenue. So in, with that being said, who is being judged? God. Remember, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his, his judgment. judgment. The hour that he allows himself to be judged, yes. In Romans 3, Paul brings that out. Um, why does it take so long? If it started in 1844, if that's when it, this whole process, why is it taking so long? Because Satan has a counterfeit system. A counterfeit legal system that has corrupted the minds of men, and they don't even realize what really needs to be cleansed. All righty. Uh, from last week's lesson, before we get into 10, let's go back to 9. Look at um, on Monday's lesson. It says the following in, in the last paragraph. No, and get your mind. You, uh, most of you have heard something like this, but this is a quote. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments not founded upon our merits, but upon his own. Have you all heard this before? Well, how would you explain it? Yeah. Christ is in heaven pleading his merits in our behalf. How do you explain it? Yes. He's pleading with us. Oh, I like it where you're going with this. I like very much where you're going with this. Um, so, yeah, so the question is, to whom is he pleading? Mm -hmm. Would he not, as was said back there, be presenting his pleas, Christ pleading, to those who are being negatively impacted 
by Satan's accusations. Mm -hmm. You following my point with that? If Satan's accusing, who needs to hear the pleas of Christ? Those who are being persuaded, impacted, influenced, discouraged, pulled down, uh, whatever, by the accusations of, of Satan. If, if somebody has clarity that, that, that what Satan says has no impact on them at all, then they don't need to be pled with, do they? Okay? So, are there any beings in heaven who are actually listening to what Satan is saying? Mm -hmm. Does God give credence to Satan's allegations? When Jesus went to raise Moses from the dead and the devil popped up to try to challenge him, did they have a tribunal, have a court scene, have evidence put forth? Jesus begins pleading his merits in behalf of, of Moses. Did you see this happening or did you just hear, the Lord rebuke you, talk to the hand. Yep. Not listening. <laughs> I mean, that's what happened, right? How about in Zechariah when the high priest is, a, is, is being accused by the devil? Do we have a tribunal, a court scene? Again, Jesus pleading his merits on behalf of, oh, please, my blood, my, or do we just simply have the Lord rebuke you? Not listening. And see, take away his filthy garments, put on him clean garments. See, I've taken away your sin. I'm healing you. I'm restoring you. We're not listening to what he says. Mm -hmm. You see what's happening? The heaven is not listening to these allegations going on. And this is from the author. Listen to, listen to one of the founders of our church. And you might want to mark this down somewhere. If anybody brings up this idea again about Satan needs to plead our case in heaven to heavenly beings, including, you know, God in our behalf, uh, Desire of Ages 761. Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Henceforth, his work was restricted. Whatever attitude he might assume, he could no longer await the angels as they came from the heavenly courts and before them accuse Christ's brethren of being clothed in the garments of black men and the defilement of sin. Do you hear what he's being said here? Accusations that Satan are making, he can't do it in heaven anymore. He can't accuse us before the heavenly beings of being sinners anymore. The reason? Not because God put a force shield around earth and he's like, bzz, bzz, and can't get off of earth, but because all the beings in heaven have no sympathy for him anymore. They have been persuaded. They've been so settled into the truth about God and so settled into the reality of Satan's evil and selfishness and deception that nothing he says has any weight with them. That's why nobody up there is listening to his accusations. So then who's listening? To whom is, whom is Satan presenting his accusations? When he accuses. To you and me. To you and me. You're sinful. You've gone too far. You're too corrupt. God doesn't love sinners. God, don't waste your time going to Jesus. Just give up. Your salvation is lost. You've committed the unpardonable sin. God, in order to be just, must punish. And he's got to punish you for the sins you've committed. This is Satan. Putting it in our heads. Accusing us. So who does Christ, to whom does Christ need to plead and plead? Us. To us. To us. We're the ones he's pleading with. And that's why Jesus said in John 16 to his disciples, I have much to say to you, but you can't bear it. But when the Spirit, when he, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. Mm -hmm. Well, who do you think the Spirit is listening to when he speaks to you? Wouldn't it be the person who sent him? Yep. On whose behalf he's here? So when Jesus is pleading in heaven, he's pleading through the Spirit to your heart and mind. Mm -hmm. Basically, I love you. Don't listen to the lies of Satan. You are worth the universe to me. I gave my life to save you. You haven't gone too far. Let me heal you. Trust me and I will cleanse your mind, renew your heart, take away your fear. I'll heal your wounds and give you a new heart and right spirit. Is it? It isn't about the mistakes you've made in the past, but about the condition of your heart, mind, and character today. And if you let me, I will heal you. This is what Christ is pleading in our behalf. Are you hearing the plea? Or do you have this other idea that blocks you from experience the pleas of Christ to your own heart because you have this view of the Father is angry and you're terrified of him and you actually in your mind are praying that Jesus will plead his dad and he's going like, dad doesn't need it, you do. If God is for us, who can be against us? He's already on your side. The war. It's in our minds. Remember the war? It's in our minds. 
over the concept of God that we hold. Sunday's lesson, first paragraph, points out um, that the little horn power seeks to take away the daily. What do you guys understand the daily to be? Some, some, some translations say daily sacrifice. What do you understand that to, to, to me, to be? The sacrificial system. The little horn power takes away the sacrificial system? What do y'all think? What does the sacrificial system represent or stand for? Your understanding of it. So what's the little horn power taking away? <clears throat> Satan could never take, take away Christ, what Christ is doing. He could never take that away. He could never destroy that except in our own minds, our understanding of it. Do you hear what he said? He said, Satan can't take away the reality of what Christ achieved for us at the cross. That is historic. It's, re- it's done, it's over, it's achieved. He can't take away the achievement. So what can he take away? The meaning of it. The meaning of it, our understanding of it, our confidence in it, our reliance upon it. So he can take away the daily, meaning when Paul says, I die daily. Remember Paul said this, I die daily. He is referring to what this daily sacrifice was supposed to be. Remember it said, present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord. This daily sacrifice was symbolic of us sacrificing and surrendering every day, opening our hearts in trust and love relationship to the Lord so that we receive the indwelling spirit and the transforming power. Taking away the daily means simply that it takes away that relationship. We don't daily rely upon Christ. We rely on something else. And we don't rely upon Christ daily for inner transformation. We rely upon Christ instead for something else. What else might we rely upon Christ for? Pardon? Legal pardon. Legal pardon. This is is what's happening. This change in this law concept resulted in that. And thus, people end up in, in different organizations arguing back and forth over which ritual is the right ritual. Um... Somebody emailed me a link. Which day is the right day? So, yeah, that too. That's part of the, the ritual, isn't it? Yeah. Somebody emailed me a link to, uh, and it's, I put it in the notes if you want to go watch it. It is a, uh, a debate, discussion, dialogue, I'm not sure what you want to call it, between a Protestant uh, minister and a Catholic priest um, over the Eucharist. And the Protestant, of course, alleges that the, this, the Protestantism often alleges that the Eucharist is taking away the daily. Because what's happening is the priest is standing in the, in, the, in the place of Christ, our high priest, and you have to go through the human priest, and so they're taking away our access to Christ going through the Eucharist. This is kind of the argument that is often made by Protestants. And in this debate, they went back and forth um, over things like whether the priest could stand in for Christ, over a sacrifice of Christ uh, was being sacrificed his blood was father over and over again and, and whether it's even lawful to partake of blood because you know in the, in the belief system of some when you take the Eucharist it, it transubstantiation it becomes the blood and the body and the flesh literally in our system and so they're arguing over these things that I find quite petty actually and this is what the Catholic priest said here's a quote there are two elements to any sacrifice the immolation and the offering The immolation is a bloody death. The lamb is slain. What is precious about that is the life is in the blood of the lamb and is precious and that pays God back. That's how the Old Testament rituals used to work. The immolation happened once, but the offering is something Christ does for all eternity. He is right now in the presence of the Father, in the Holy of Holies, in the eternal presence, offering himself to the Father for the forgiveness of our sins. Christ isn't killed again and again and again. He is offering in the Eucharist, in the same eternal presence as his Father himself, again and again and again. Do you like this view? What did that say about God? He says, what does that say about God? Why don't we pause for a minute? If that were true, what does that say about God? Never satisfied. That's exactly how Satan alleged him to be. He, he's never satisfied. That's how Satan alleged him to be. Any other things that, that come to mind if you see God in this way? Bloodthirsty? Mm-hmm. How about unjust? Seriously, they call this justice. But, but really, is it unjust? If this were really the way it is, is it just to take somebody who is innocent and execute them for the crimes of the guilty? Is that just? No. no, but that's what they claim happens. Christ the innocent is executed by his father for the crimes of the guilty, and they call it justice. 
It's a perversion. It's twisted. Well, the priest said it, it was in this offering of his sacrifice over and over again that the sins were paid for to the Father, paying the Father back. So each time we sin, we must take mass in order to have the sacrifice of Christ presented to the Father again. He was only sacrificed once, but each time we sin and we take mass, then Jesus goes to the Father and says, I know it was only sacrificed once, here's my sacrifice again to pay for that sin. That sin now needs to be paid for. It's the, here's the fine, my blood, and, and take the payment, basically. Yes? This is sort of like once saved, always saved. Once you've given your heart to, to Jesus, then, then, then that should be, that puts you on that path. Well, the one saved, always saved has a slightly different aspect than this. Than this. this this aspect of the Eucharist would not say one saved, every, always saved. This would say that if you don't go and have the mass for every sin, then that sin has not been paid and, and you'll have to be punished by God for that sin, but so you have to go each time. The one saved, always saved, though, has the legal element in it, and that is when we go and accept Jesus as our Savior, and, and maybe I'll, I'll get to the Protestant view here in just a second, okay? Yeah, no, it, it, that's a great question. Um, so how do you think the Protestant theologian responded to this? The, Pro the Protestant theologian responded with the argument that Christ is not in heaven offering his sacrifice over and over to the Father. He is offering his merits over and over to the Father in our behalf. Think about that for a minute. In the Protestant view, all, all the sins, this is what we're getting, all the sins, past, present, and future, all of our future sins, in the Catholic view, every time we sin, we have to go to Christ and receive forgiveness right now through taking the Mass, and he goes and presents his sacrifice to the Father. In the Protestant view that's being argued is all those future sins we haven't even committed yet have already been placed on Christ, and, and God punished Christ in our stead, and, he, and, all, and the full punishment was, was placed upon Christ. So all sins, past, present, and future, were placed upon Christ and, and punished then, and, and all we have to do now is accept the punishment that's already taken, and then Christ, when we sin, isn't offering the sacrifice. It's already over. He's offering his merits that he's earned in our behalf for doing that great, wonderful thing in our behalf to his father. And reminding him, basically saying, remember dad, I already paid for their sins. Remember, remember dad, you can't hold them accountable because I paid already. Payment's already done. That's what, that's what the art, yes. Isn't that those two views actually have the same identical view of God? Yes. Yes, that's the problem. This is why Satan sits and laughs. Yeah. He's got these two huge giant systems, Catholicism and Protestantism, arguing over pettiness while they still hold the distorted view of God who is an angry, wrathful, must punish sin and must be appeased. And they make a big deal over whether it's sacrifice or merits being offered to him. It's neither. God was in the Son reconciling the world to himself. Yes. And how is that really any different than at Mount Carmel when the Baal priests cut themselves trying to get Baal's attention? It's the same view of a deity that pagans hold. Actually, it is paganism. It really is. Let me tell you, Baal worship, for those who don't, don't remember some of our previous sessions, Baal was the son of El, E-L, as in Elohim El Shaddai, the son of El. Baal was the uh, god of, of weather. He brought the rain. He, brought the, the, uh, the, he, was, he was the god of life who brought, pro, who brought fertility to the land and brought the, the, pro, the produce each spring. Uh, he was the god who fought against Leviathan, the great serpent. So he fights the serpent on our behalf. And he fights against the god of death named Mote. And in his battle with death, he dies, rises again to bring life to the earth. He, uh, Baal in Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word for Baal means husband and protector, and the Hebrews actually called Yahweh Baal, uh, and you have their cities, Baal Pereth and Baal Peor, were named after the husband and protector of Israel. So what is the problem with worshiping a God who is the husband and protector of Israel, who is the son of El, who is the source of life, who uh, fights against the serpent, who fights against death, dies on our behalf, and rises again? Thank God. The problem with it is Baal, that God, required payment and appeasement. That's the problem. And what happened is Baal, the God of thunder and weather and lightning, became Zeus to the Greeks, the God of thunder, became Jupiter to the Romans, became Thor to the Norse people, and became Jesus Christ in the Dark Ages to the church 
who worships a God that has Jesus pleading a sacrifice to his father to appease him. That's exactly, that's why Malachi gives a prophecy that before the coming great day of the Lord, I've got to send the prophet Elijah again to call the people out of this misery, to turn the hearts and the fathers and the sons back to each other to the God of love and his design protocols for love. And thus there's a movement that's supposed to arise on earth that calls the people, if Yahweh is like this, This God who is angry and wrathful must be appeased and worship him. But if he's actually like Christ who gave himself on our behalf to heal and restore, then worship him. And the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation continues. Yes, the Protestant Reformation continues. So let's keep going on with this. So the Protestant theologian, each time we, we sin, we don't go to a priest to take mass to have sacrifice presented to the Father. No, no, no. Our sins were paid for past, past, present, and future. This gets into the once saved, always saved thing. So if we accept that payment, past, present, and future, then nothing can take us out of the hand, and all of our sins, even though we're going to commit them later, have already been paid for, and we have legal pardon, so we're saved, and we're, we're good. We're good. All's good. Mm-hmm. That's assuming you really accept the Lord in your heart. Well, no, when, but th- that's the problem. This system doesn't require a heart change. This system only requires you get legal pardon. You go through the right rituals. You get baptized in the right way. You, you take communion in the proper way. You, you get your feet washed in the proper way. I mean, you, you, I mean you, this, this just requires you go to church on the right day. I mean, you have to keep the system and keep the rules, and then everything's good. You don't actually have to have a change of heart because it's all legal. It's happening in record books. Record books are being cleansed, not people, in this penal substitutionary system. In re- Except that years before. That's exactly right. This is system, system, system's been corrupted. So Daniel 7, what's the problem? What's the problem? Daniel 7, it says a little horn would, um, little horn power would seek to change God's law by getting us to replace the truth about the law of love, the design protocols, the creator builder with this imperial Roman dictator type law. Catholic and Protestant, both have accepted this change to God's law. And both teach Christ needs to die to pay the legal penalty, to appease the wrath and anger of the Father, um, so that the Father won't punish us. So the gospel, the good news about God's kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of love has not gone to the world. What's gone to the world is this Roman counterfeit, imperial Roman counterfeit, that God runs his universe like a Caesar runs Rome. In the uh, lesson, the third paragraph, it says the little horn follows right after the ram, Medo-Persia, and the he-goat, Greece. Therefore, it must be identified historically as Rome, which came after the kingdoms of Medo-Persia and Greece. Though the little horn started out as imperial Rome, the greater emphasis is on papal Rome, the primary focus of the vision. I want to question you guys. Is this really the true emphasis on papal Rome or on Christian Rome? Christian Rome. Do you see how it makes us Protestants feel good to make it papal? See, that's them, not us. Is there any difference? Well, let me ask you a couple of questions. Does one have to be papal or Catholic to worship an, the imperial god of Rome, no. the dictator god? Does one have to belong to a particular organization in order to value or cherish the lies of the little horn? Mm-hmm. No. This is not about papal or Protestant. This is about how do you conceive of God, his law, his character, his, his protocols, his methods. And you can be right in the, the Protestant denomination that you consider to be the remnant and still be worshiping the same God as, you know, Dark Ages Christianity. Here's Great Controversy 583. Great Controversy 583. In rejecting the truth, men reject its author. In trampling upon the law of God, they deny the authority of the lawgiver. It is as easy to make an idol of false doctrines and theories as to fashion an idol of wood and stone. By misrepresenting the attributes of God, Satan leads men to conceive of him in a false character. Notice notice the focus. It's not actually a piece of wood. It's how do you conceive of God? With many, a philosophical idol is enthroned in the place of Jehovah. While the living God, as he is revealed in his word, in Christ and in the works of creation, notice that. His word is Christ and the works of creation. Oh, wow, we're going to have more than one thread. We're going to use more than just scripture. We're going to look into nature. Wow, isn't that cool? Okay. And the works of nature uh, and work of creation is worshiped by a few. Thousands deify nature while they deny the God of nature. Though in a different form, idolatry exists in the Christian world today. In a different form. 
as verily as it existed among the ancient Israel in the days of Elijah. That's Baal worship she's talking about. The God of, of many professed wise men, of philosophers, poets, politicians, journalists, the God of polished fashionable circles, of many college and universities, even of some theological institutions, is little better than Baal, the sun god of Phoenicia. Wow. I love her. <laughs> She's so right. It's so right. Many Seventh-day Adventists want to make the problem about God's law the problem about, with God's law and Christianity about which day one worships on. That's what they want to isolate it down to. Yep. They fail to recognize that the Jews who crucified Christ wanted him down by sunset to keep the Sabbath. That was the reason. We, we got to have him down. And so they're keeping the Sabbath. They got the day. They got the day. But they got the Baal version of God in their hearts. And so they killed the creator of all. Babylon. Thus many Seventh-day Adventists, because they have accepted an imposed law construct and teach God runs his universe like humans run human governments, needing legal payments inflicting, and inflicting torture and death, are still trapped in a false system with distortions about God, regardless of which day they worship on. Yeah. It's not about organizational affiliation. It's about God. It's always about God. Who God is and what God are you worshiping, designer or dictator? But sadly, we fall into denominationalism. We cast criticisms at those who practice different than us. They have different worship, different music, different baptism, uh, different uh, church, uh, different day of, in which one goes to church, different clothing, all while worshiping the dictator. Do you see the problem? Monday's lesson asked the question, how long? How long? How long until the sanctuary is cleansed? <clears throat> Why does it take so long? What's the holdup? If it's a process of God going through record books, why does it take so long? If it's a process of angels going through record books, why does it take so long? I mean, isn't this what's typically... People are being born all the time. They have to go back and go back to the A's and catch up. Yeah. <laughs> but still being I mean, we laugh, but laws are still being... I mean, they had this concept in elementary school and high school, and that's, that's what was presented. Well, there's a biblical reason for the delay. Anybody care to hear what the Bible says about that? Here's what the Bible says why it takes so long. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Amen. So what's causing the delay? God's slow in getting through the books, or we're slow in figuring out who God is so we can have a change of heart and get repented and right with him. Who's the slow one? Yes. So according to Peter, the delay is, is, is failure in us to come to a true knowledge of God and, and experience repentance. Jesus actually predicted in one of his parables there would be a delay. And remember which parable? Mm -hmm. The ten virgins, that's right. The parable of the ten virgins. And if you, before I even get into that parable, remember this quotation uh, from Ellen White. Um, the coming of Christ as our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8.14. 2300 days, sanctuary will be cleansed. Daniel 8.14. The coming of the Son of Man to, as, to the Ancient of Days represented in Daniel 7.13. And the coming of the Lord to his temple foretold by Malachi 3.1-3 through 3, are descriptions of the same event. And this is also represented by the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage described by Christ in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. Four passages describing the same event. Daniel 8.14 just gives us a time frame. That's all it tells us. There's a time frame. And if you, if you believe the historical interpretation, that time frame, that prophecy ended in, in 1844 and the cleansing process began. Daniel 7 tells us it's the time when Jesus is coronated and the saints receive wisdom or discernment or judgment from God in order to free their minds from the, from the misperceptions that have been foisted upon them through the dark ages. Malachi 3 tells us that that results in cleansing of the Levites. He comes to his temple to cleanse the Levites. And Matthew 25 tells us there's a delay because some of the virgins didn't have oil and the bridegroom wanted to give them time That's right. to get some. That's right. But instead, they all fell asleep. Let's work through that. Um, let's work through that. See, here's, uh, here's Matthew 25, the parable in my paraphrase. 
It says, at that time in earth's history, God's people on earth will be like ten undefiled bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out into the dark world to meet the bridegroom. While all ten while all ten were sincere students of the word, only five were wise, the other five foolish. The five foolish went out into the dark world with their lamps of God's word, but they didn't fill themselves with the oil of the Holy Spirit. The wise, however, not only carried the lamps of God's word, but also filled the jars of their hearts with the Holy Spirit. The bridegroom took much longer than they expected in coming, and all ten bridesmaids became drowsy and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, a loud cry was heard, The bridegroom is here, come and meet him. All ten bridesmaids awoke and prepared their lamps to shine brightly. But the foolish ones realized they could not, not without the oil of the Holy Spirit. So they looked to the five wise and said, Give us some of your oil, our light is going out. But the five wise said, We can't. The oil of the Spirit that enables us to shine brightly is only provided in sufficient quantities for each lamp. You must go to the source yourself and get your own supply. While the foolish ones were out searching for oil, the bridegroom arrived. The bridesmaids who were prepared went in to the reception with him, and the door was closed. Later, the foolish ones came banging on the door, shouting, Master, let us in. But he replied, The truth is, you're not my friends. I don't know you. <clears throat> so stay alert and be vigilant, because you don't know when the Lord will return. Tim? Yes? But the Lord does not say that he waits for the foolish virgins to go to the city and buy oil. No. He's waiting now for that to happen, but they're sleeping. That's right. So they're sleeping right now. Yeah, they're sleeping right now. But they should be buying oil right now. Right. Yeah, but now. yeah, when he comes, it's too late. So he's not going to wait for, the, for them to go into the city and he's, buy oil. He's waiting now for them to buy oil. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so the question then is, what is putting the church to sleep? What has put the church to sleep? Jesus is delaying his returning to give the church time to get ready. Yeah. For the, but the church is sleeping. Meaning it's not able to get ready while asleep, is it? No. By the time the cry goes out, then it's too late. So what's putting the church to sleep? Well, let me ask you, what does alcohol do to a person? Dumbs Intoxicates, numbs the reason, and puts them to sleep. Well, listen to Revelation 14, 6 through 8. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live in the earth, to every tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment, his judgment, the hour we're going to make a decision about it, and it's come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, the springs of living water. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink of the maddening wine of her adulteries. What does alcohol do to one? This isn't literal wine, but what does alcohol do to one physically? It numbs you and puts you to sleep. What do you think this maddening wine is? Revelation 17. It numbs the senses. Num yeah, here's, here's Revelation 17. gives a little more insight. One of the seven angels who had seven bowls came to me and said, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on the many waters with her kings of the earth. Uh, with her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. In Revelation 18, which, uh, which for those who maybe don't study these that often, Revelation 18 is a fourth angel that is coming to repeat the message of the three angels before Christ returns. It says, after this, uh, which represents a, a people group that rise up to do this. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt of every evil spirit, and haunt of every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her, all the nations drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins. Note, the people of God are in fallen Babylon. Yeah. That's where they are, yeah. in fallen Babylon. And fallen Babylon is intoxicated or drunk on the wine from the prostitute. Yeah. Jim. And what does wine do to the mind? Yeah. Dulls. Dulls you and puts you to sleep. What are the, and what are the, the ten wise and the ten foolish doing? They're sleeping. They're asleep. They're, they're asleep at the wheel. Driving drunk. Yeah. Where the church maybe ends up wrecked in the ditch all the time. 
missing its mark. And what is the wine then? I'm going to suggest to you that the wine of the prostitute that gets the nations drunk are the false doctrines, the lies, the distortions that we believe that come out of that system that confuse our mind. And the primary one is the one prophesied specifically about this little horn in Daniel 7, that it would seek to change God's law. And the primary intoxicating wine is this idea that God has an imposed law and is a punisher of sinners. This is my view. Two. Why? Because it leads to the false legal security which numbs the need for true regeneration for the filling of the Holy Spirit. If the law is like ours, imposed, and breaking law requires ruling authority to impose proper punishments, the solution then is to get the proper payment made, by the ruling made to the ruling authority and then have the payment applied to one's account. Then when we claim the blood of Jesus and believe it's applied to our record in heaven, we go to spiritual sleep. Believing, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. All my sins, past, present, and future, have been paid for. The Father's accepted me, and when he looks at me, he doesn't see me. He sees Jesus standing in my place. Forgiveness has been stamped by my book in heaven, and I'm covered in the robe of righteousness, so he can't see how corrupt I am. We're sound asleep at the wheel. This false legal system infecting the church, lulling millions into spiritual apathy, in which they have false security of legal salvation, but no actual regeneration of heart, renewal of character, in other words, they have lamps, they have their Bibles, but they have no oil, That's right. no Holy Spirit, which is the regenerating power which transforms the individual. That's right. And thus, we go back to the Bible definition of what's supposed to happen and look at all the metaphors. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We want renewal of the heart by the Holy Spirit. We want, re we want circumcision of the heart by the Holy Spirit. We want to remove the heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. We want the law written upon the heart and mind. We want to have the mind of Christ. We want the, to be reborn. We want to be renewed. We want the old to go away and the new to come. Everything in the scripture is not about a legal pardon. It's about actual indwelling spirit, transformational, regenerational, recreating us. Amen. And this system that come out of Rome puts people into false of security and lulls them to spiritual sleep. That's right. And whether you're Catholic or Protestant, the church is asleep. That's right. See, All right, go ahead. It doesn't say come out of the church. It, it says it come out of Babylon, come out of the darkness in the church. Yes, and, 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 and where are God's people? The, yes, he says, come out of her, my people. So my people are being found in Babylon. In darkness. In darkness. In darkness. Yes. Yeah, so and, and so and so his people make up the church. Church. So where's the church found? In Babylon. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, so to paraphrase what you're saying is, is, it, is it a religion or some preaching that gives false doctrine puts Christians to sleep rather than awaken them to the true love, the true message. I, I would say that would be true. What do you all think? Do you, if you disagree, it's okay. I mean, I, I'm not claiming I know all things here. I'm just putting out some ideas for you to think about. So what do you think about this idea? What do you think about this idea of the, of the virgins being asleep because the church has accepted distortions about God's system and they have this false security they're lulled into? Some of them, even in that false system, and there are good people, let me tell you, this is why I think the, the five virgins, five wives, five fools, there are good people, and the five wives were sleeping too, in the legal model system that have the Holy Spirit in their life. They're asleep, but they still have the Holy Spirit. So just because you believe that idea doesn't mean you are necessarily lost or in the, in the, in the five foolish side. Because they're all sleeping. So they don't understand, but they're still changing their heart. And yes. But there are others who who's, has no spirit. They just have the word. They'd be very pharisaical, legalistic type Christians, um, rules oriented, doing everything. And they're the ones that don't want to think. They don't want to grow. They don't want to advance. It says in Thessalonians, the, those that are lost are lost because they did not love the truth and thus be saved. The, the, those who are in a system of Babylon but have hearts that are moved by the Spirit have hearts that value truth and are willing to move, willing to advance, willing to explore, willing to develop. Even if they haven't understood a concept yet, they're open to move in the direction of truth. Whereas those who have closed their mind to truth 
are, are, are more the foolish ones. They don't have the spirit of truth working in their heart. Uh, yes, I think you had your hand first. No, you, you go ahead. It kind of reminds me of the disciples as they were going to, um, to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And you know, they didn't understand what this whole thing was about. And they sat by the tree, tried to stay awake, but had no idea what, what pressure was on them at the time. It reminds me of the, uh, the same virgins falling asleep at that same thing. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And do you see where we are in Earth's history? Do you see the importance of waking up? Waking up to what's happening to, to get the, the intoxication off of our brains and characters where we can actually maybe be part of this, this, this loud cry that goes out to wake up the, the sleeping saints to actually l trim their lamps. So they, and trim the lamps meaning? What's, what's it mean to trim the lamp? If you would connect it to the, the history of the, of the sanctuary service, did you know that every morning and every evening the lamp stand was trimmed? So that it would burn brightly, trimming away the, 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 the residue and stuff that would interfere with, the, with his... And, and who trimmed the lamp? Only the high priest. Only the high priest. None of the daily priests trimmed the lamp. Only the high priest. Symbolic of what? That Christ is the one that works in our heart through the Holy Spirit to cut a circumcision of the heart by the Holy Spirit, to cut away the, the residue of the old life so that we can burn brighter and brighter and brighter for him. That's part of the metaphor. It's really beautiful. This is, uh, again, from my, my, my uh, expanded paraphrase in Revelation. Reads, uh, Revelation 6 through 8 and then 17 and 18. Uh, one, a couple of verses out of each of those. So then I saw another messenger flying in midair, and he had the eternal good news about God's character of love to proclaim to everyone living on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people, which represents a movement of people who arise to proclaim the truth about God's character of love throughout the world. He said in a clear, resounding voice, be in awe of God and glorify him by living his methods of love because the hour has come for everyone to make a judgment about God and worship the designer, creator, and builder who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, the spring of water, which, which all operate upon the law of love. Then I saw a second messenger following the first proclaiming throughout the world, don't trust Babylon the Great, a symbolic description of religions that misrepresent God. It has fallen into the lies about God and intoxicates the world with its pagan views of God, maddening them with its adulterous ideas that God coerces and must inflict punishment if not properly appeased. In 17.1, one, one of the seven angels who had been one of the seven bowls came to me and said, come with me and I will show you the damning end of the great prostitute who sits upon the many waters symbolic of false religions that misrepresent God. The leaders of the world took their governments into bed with her, sharing in her plans, plots, and methods, and the people of the earth had their minds so filled with her lies about God and his methods that they were like drunks, stuporous, and unable to be reasoned with or embrace the truth. And then last eight, uh, 18. After this, I saw another messenger come down from heaven, symbolizing the godly origins of his message. He had, the great, he had the great authority and power of truth, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a voice reverberating throughout the earth, he shouted, Babylon the Great is a fallen system of tradition, fable, and falsehood, distorting the truth about God. Every demonic distortion about God, every evil attitude toward God, and all the filthy and destructive heart motives find their home with her. For she intoxicates the world with her pagan views of God, maddening them with her adulterous ideas that God coerces and must inflict punishment if not properly appeased. Earth's leaders corrupt themselves with her by practicing her methods, and people not anchored in God's kingdom of love, but who wander from philosophy to philosophy, stuff their minds with her smorgasbord of lies. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Leave that confusing mess of evil thinking so that you will not share in her spiritual sickness and rebellion so that you do not receive the suffering she has chosen. What do you think? Comments, thoughts? Yeah, Russell. I like the praising the suffering you have chosen because that's... Uh, that's the uh, that's the consistent thread through the scripture. Is that whatever happens in the end will be the choice of, of either party, the sheep or the goats. It will be their choice. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people still, because they have that imperial law concept, they see God sitting in judgment and dictating and determining outcomes and inflicting punishments. But you know, we have so many examples in scripture of God's judgment. Um, in Hosea, God makes a judgment about Ephraim. 
Ephraim is tied to his idols. Let him go. There's a judgment. Now, does God's judgment, Ephraim is tied to his idols, let him go, does God's judgment cause Ephraim to be tied to his idols? No, it just diagnoses what's actually true. And in the end, God diagnoses accurately the actual heart condition of each one of us. We are either restored and in harmony with God, his methods and kingdom, or we have so settled ourselves into the opposition that nothing can move us out of it. Do you think there's a danger of traditions? Shuffle through and have no real concept of, of yes. it exists. Yes, he says there are danger in rituals and yes, let's talk about that for a minute. I think it actually develops superstition. How, what is the devil's power over us? Lies. Lies that he gets us to believe. Think about the power of a lie. If you uh, if your if your employer did uh, you know, health screening at your place, and they, uh, you know, drew some blood, and uh, doing cholesterol, and what, 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 and other things, and, and they come back to you sometime later, and somebody with a lab coat calls you in an office and says, you know, when we did your blood work, um, we discovered you're HIV positive. But they're lying to you. It's not true. They're wanting to mess with you. They're not joking. So they look very serious, look very sad. We're very sad, and they start giving you all this HIV counseling, and you believe the lie. If you believe you're HIV positive, you walk away from there believing that's true, will it affect you? Will you be different? Will it have power over you? Will you have peace? Will you want to sleep with your spouse that night? <laughs> Think about the damaging cascade. Now, what's actually changed in reality? <laughs> Nothing. But that lie will destroy you. Now, which lie is actually more, which, which lie is more awful? Or which, which, which situation, not lie, which situation is more awful? To be HIV positive or to believe that God will torment you in hell? <laughs> which is a more awful situation? Okay? Okay, and so here's the lie. You see how damaging believing you're HIV positive, what it would do to you. What do you think this lie does that God, in order to be just, must use his power to torture and kill? It is a horrible lie. It's destructive. Satan has his power. And so he gets us to believe, believe things that aren't true and has power over us. You see this in Romans chapter 14 where Paul says, those of you who are mature or have great faith can eat anything you want, but those with little faith eat only vegetables. Be vegetarian. Now, what's the context? The context was in the meat market in Rome, all the meat that was sold in the meat market got offered to their pagan idols first. So when they would slaughter the animal, they slaughtered it in a sacrificial offering to whichever one of their idols they were worshiping. And then after they, they offered the, the animal to the idol, then they would cut it up and butcher it and take it to the meat market and sell the meat to make money. And some of the Christians knew because they were pagans before they converted, and they were afraid if I eat the meat that had been offered to the idol, maybe I'll be cursed. Maybe the, the idol will have power over me. And Paul says, look, an idol is just stone or wood or metal. It can't do anything to the food. So if your faith is great and you realize that it's just a piece of wood and stone and has no power of the food, then you can eat it and it won't have any power. But if you believe, you believe, remember the power of belief from our seminar, if you believe that eating that food will put power over you, then your faith is weak and you better not eat it because then, and that's superstition, you see? That somehow, in this type of superstition, somehow the meat has been affected by the idol mm -hmm is actually changing a belief in your mind like believing you're HIV positive and that's where the real power is. And this is superstition just like sins being transferred to the sanctuary. Think with me now. Can sin contaminate that chair? Can sin contaminate an altar built out of gold? Oh, that's harder now. You're, getting, you're messing with me. <laughs> Seriously. Can sin contaminate physical matter? No. No. Physical matter does not need cleansing from sin. What needs cleansing from sin is intelligent beings, hearts, minds, characters. And so we have this superstitious belief being taught in Adventism primarily for this aspect of it. Then we confess our sins, the building in heaven made out of inanimate materials is now contaminated, and that building needs to be cleansed. It needs, it needs some heavenly whitewash. Mr. Clean, he said. Needs some heavenly Mr. Clean. <laughs> Buildings and inanimate materials can no, can no more be contaminated by sin than that food can be contaminated by that idol. You following me on this? 
It's our hearts, minds, characters that deviate from God's design of love. They're filled with fear and selfishness and lies and distortions. That's what needs cleansing. But we're asleep at the wheel because we've got this imperial law construct and we believe that actual deeds are confessed and deeds are transformed and, and things become contaminated and things need to be cleansed. And so we are praying that God in heaven will investigate our books and do something in the books up there so that we have legal pardon and we can feel safe. Oh man, so glad he's up there. He's my advocate praying and pleading my case in heavenly court right now. I've got a good lawyer up there. He's the best. <laughs> but nothing's happening in here. Right. You see the problem with that? We're asleep. This is why Christ waits. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's delaying because he doesn't want anyone to be lost. Will the church wake up? Will Christians around the world wake up? I hope they do. I want the Lord to come. This is what he's waiting for. We have an opportunity to, to take this message to them. So this battle, in Tuesday's lesson, talks about the little horn that wages war against the saints. Is the primary battle against the saints physical? You remember Christ said, don't be afraid of the one who can destroy the body, but can't destroy the soul. Soul, Greek word, psyche. Your mind, your individuality, your character can't destroy your... The, the, you, can be, you can be killed physically by another person. But no other being can sully your soul, sear your conscience, warp your character. That requires your willful participation. You follow me on that? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego standing on the plain of Dura could be physically killed if God didn't intervene. But they could not be forced to bow. Oh yeah, soldiers could have come up and they could have cut their Achilles tendons and they could have been forced down. But you know something? They're still not bowing, are they? To actual bow requires the heart to give in. That's an individual. It happens within. You can't, it can't be forced. Thus the war is over ideas, concepts, and belief. Wednesday's lesson talking about the last paragraph, it says, the horn's war in the realm of religion is countered and cut short by divine intervention carried out in the context of the eschatological day of atonement. At last, terror finds its end and God's people, the true, the true worship, God's, yeah, and God's people, the true worship, and the sanctuary are restored to their rightful position and, right position, and in the final analysis, God himself is vindicated. As God demonstrated in the day of atonement, that he is just in, do, in doing, just in his dealings and judgments by forgiving the loyal and judging the disloyal and rebellious. So the eschatological day of atonement will verify that God is just when he saves and when he punishes. Any thoughts about that? Hmm. Well, so, yes, rulers hold that, give, give them power over you to so that you, you conduct yourself the way they want, wish to. Say that again? Well, it, it, it's like a hierarchy of whatever uh, gives that impression that, that uh, you know, you've got to have forgiveness and they're the ones that grant it. Mm -hmm. so they use that to wield power. Over yes, I see. Organizations exactly. okay, will, will use this intimidation and threat and need for forgiveness to control the masses. Right. Religious organizations will do this. Awesome. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's been done. It's done historically. It's still being done. Um, it, does this method, what kind of God, it, it, what would it say about sin? Sin itself. If it actually requires God to use his power to punish it. See, if, if, if sin actually requires, here, here's Satan's argument. If sin actually, re, you're right. If sin actually requires God to punish, then, then this is what Satan says. Look, God, guys, I never said God wasn't powerful. I never said that. I said he's not good. If he could just get a little handle on his anger and wrath, get a little self-control like I've got, <laughs> not lash out and use his power to punish us, if you just let us have freedom, which we don't have in his universe because he's a control monger, if he just gave us real freedom and not use his power to hurt us, we could live eternity in sin because there's nothing wrong with sin. There's something wrong with God who gets mad when we do it. 
That's penal substitution theology, and that's what they argue. God has to punish sin. And inherently that means there is really nothing wrong or harmful with sin itself. And they're sustaining Satan's argument in Desire of Ages 762 or 761. Every sin must meet its punishment, urged Satan. Yes, Russell. It also ties in with the, the dualism uh, theories of, of you know, Buddhism and some of the Eastern mysticisms that you talked about a few weeks ago, that you know, good and evil must coexist in, in opposing forces and that evil will be, will be around forever as well. Yeah, exactly. Satan would love that idea. And we, and we perpetuate that with either the eternal burning hell idea or the idea that life comes from God, he's the creator, but death originates in God himself. Ask, if you want to have some conversation with friends who hold that other view, begin asking this question. Who do you believe killed Christ at the cross? God or Satan? If they say, sin, sin killed Christ at the cross. Say, okay, let's, we'll, go, we'll run with that. Who's the originator of sin? <laughs> Where, if, we, if, we, if you want to take sin and we trace it back to its source where does it have its origination Satan so Satan is still the killer of Christ at the cross if you want to use that or are you going to say God you see and they don't want to say it but if you were at the seminar you see that that's where that other theory leads and I'm going to tell you it's a lie God did not kill Christ at the cross God is not the source of death. Jesus himself said Satan was a murderer from the beginning. Death originates in deviation from God's design. Satan is the father of lies and that causes us to distrust God, deviate from his design, and the only result out there is death because we're out of harmony with how God built life to operate. Um, so Wednesday's lesson talked about this idea that he punishes. Sin, my view, is that unremedied sin destroys the sinner. And God one day will let go of his restraint. He is currently holding at bay the inevitable outcome that would happen. This world is actually in an artificial pocket of reality. <clears throat> held by God's grace from, uh, from, from disintegration. And one day God removes his restraining hand as he removes the saints from this world and the world disintegrates. Yes? Reading that last paragraph, if you left off everything after God is just or God is righteous, if you change just to righteous, and you left off he saves and when he punishes, would you have a problem with that? No, I think that much of, much of what that's okay, that God is being vindicated in this. That's what we're talking about, sure. It's their termination of their thought. The end result is deviation. But see, the most, the most, what are the most powerful and dangerous lies? Those that are obvious and overt, let's go worship Satan in a coven. Or those that approximate near the truth. In a poison in your house is the most dangerous poison, the one that has skulls and crossbones and stuff labeled all over it, poison, poison, danger, or the poison that actually is in the sugar bottle. And somebody puts the poison in there. And which is the more dangerous one? You see? So I agree that it's very, very close, but that's the whole point, isn't it? It makes it all the more dangerous. Yes. Yes, God is being vindicated, but vindicated of what? Yes, vindicated of what? You want to answer that? Who sure. he is. Pardon? Who he is. Who he is. His nature, his character, his methods, his principles. Exactly right. And he's vindicated by demonstrating that he does not inflict death. It doesn't come from him. And at the cross, if you want to look at Christ, our substitute, which we believe in, what did God do to us? My God, my God, why are you raining fire down from heaven to burn me? No. But they, 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 they don't even get that. Why have you let me go? Why have you given me up? Right. Vindicated that he forgives our sins. But how does he forgive our sins? By paying for them? Or by forgiving them? I, what, any, anyone want to comment to that? Go, go ahead, Eve. I just had a comment about the, the statement itself. There is, there's another subtle lie in the statement that says God's people, the true worship, and the sanctuary. That implies that God's people and the sanctuary are two different things. Yes. So it's easy to miss. And you Thank you. Go, oh, it sounds fine. But 
is a division that doesn't exist. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And I've had a dialogues uh, this past couple of weeks with some people who follow, have followed us online and, and they have some concerns and some people are really stuck. Uh, now, let me just be clear. I believe that there are inanimate objects in heaven. Uh, mansions, gold, uh, gates of pearls. You want to be, I mean, I have no problem with the literal physical buildings in heaven. But they're not the sanctuary that needs cleansing. Okay? The sanctuary that needs cleansing is the sanctuary of the human soul that is defiled and corrupt because of sin and filled with lies and distortions about God. Our minds, our hearts, our characters. And the Bible, and I'm not going to go through it again because I've gone through it many times in here, multiple Bible references that document clearly that the heavenly sanctuary, not built with human hands, is a house built out of intelligent beings. But I still do believe, but some people can't get their mind about it. They insist, no, there is a gold lampstand in heaven. There is a box made out of wood with gold covered on it with gold angels sitting on top of it. And there is a golden altar. And Jesus is actually offering incense that's going up in smoke when we pray. They're very, very concrete this way. I feel sad for them. It's symbols to teach us a larger reality. And the incense, by the way, is the fragrance of Christ's righteousness that is to arise from the altar of your heart as you surrender yourself and live your life in harmony with him. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are not like Satan has alleged, that we have real freedom with you, that you have come in the, in, in the form of Christ in partaking of our our, our fallen state in order to heal and overcome and to reveal the truth and destroy the lies and develop what we could not. And we ask now for your spirit to take all that Christ has achieved, reproduce it in us, and give us the ability to have clarity in our thinking, the wisdom and discernment, to be able to communicate effectively because, Lord, the church is asleep, but we want to wake up because we want to meet you when you come. We pray in your holy name. Amen.